No worries, everyone can hear me. I usually don't know the PO system. Um, but anyway, look, I've been asked to come and talk about opportunity for food lots, drought lots, and I was having a quick flick through the program, and one thing I noticed was I'm one of the few people that didn't have references. So I'll make references now, and that's really so sort of, I probably had one of the best jobs in the world as a beef cattle officer. I got to go out to Blake's Farms, I got to see what worked, I was out on them constantly, I saw what didn't work, I saw the disasters and I saw the successes. So it was one of those things, but I thought I'd set it up because it's one of these things and it's, it's something I get a lot of questions at, what are we actually looking at, what's a drought lot, what's a feed lot, uh, what's an opportunity feed lot. A drought lot is really combined with feeding in the drought. It's your, it's your own cattle, not bought in cattle. So if you all of a sudden go out and decide to start using a drought as an opportunity to trade, you're sort of getting away from a, a drought lot. Uh, no specific approval is required for a drought lot. Um, and you just need to be aware as a producer, if you're going to put it on a creek, you need to be aware of protecting the Environment, Environment Operations Act. Um, so just be aware where you're putting it. Uh, feedlot, opportunity feedlot, really falls under uh, State Environmental Plan 30 and it comes down to 50 head or more, okay? In saying that, you've got to check with your local government area. It's one of these things that we find that some local government areas have got different requirements. So I can think of a couple that basically, if you've got two animals on feed, they want to know about it. So just, just have a look at, at, at your own local uh, requirements. Production feeding and, and looking at that type of thing, it's one of those ones that I get lots of questions, you know, how am I going to do it, is it worthwhile, is it not worthwhile? Check your sums. You really need to get in and have a look at, do your numbers and crunch your numbers hard and fast before you look at it. Work on the leaner side, and, and when I say work on the leaner side, you know, it's assume they're going to eat more, you know, allow a little bit more for waste. Don't overestimate performance and price. It's one of these great things, the further I go north, the more cattle grow up three kilos a day. Um, the further I come south, the more realism I start to get and I get talking about just under two kilos and things like that. So be realistic with their performance. Don't, don't start off at all my cattle have really got the best genetics in the world, they'll grow up three kilos. Uh, to give you an idea, one of the feedlots that I used to do a lot of work with uh, in the north, north of the state, 100 days on grain, their average across, and this is steam flake rail grain, everything done right, is around about 1.8, and that's through uh, autumn, winter, spring, summer, drops back to 1.6. Okay, so be realistic with your, with your performance. The other thing, get some really good advice, and, and seek that advice. Um, I know I've been pretty lucky, I've learned a lot from farmers, things that don't work, you get some things that fall over, but I was also very lucky, as, as Steve sort of said, I had access to some of the, some ter terrific nutritionalists through my career. Um, also, know your market specs. Know exactly what they require. So if you're going to put animals on, on feed, look at what's there. We've got uh, MLA, uh, more version pasture out there. There's a lovely tool that the department developed up, beef specs calculator. You know, you can look at the performance of those animals, how they're going to actually go. Finally, You've done that, check your sums again. Get in to crunch the numbers. And look, it's something that we've seen in the last 12 months that sort of previously we didn't see a huge amount. There's now forward contracts. We used to see a lot with sheep, but there's some forward contracts out there for beef. So make yourself aware of those. If you're going to lock in, commit to putting animals on feed, look at, look at your opportunity to lock, lock in prices. A few points. When you're buying feed, always do it on an energy, protein, and dry matter basis, okay? Um, I, I love these things. Uh, I got quoted a product the other day that it looked really cheap. When I sat down and worked out how much moisture was in it, it was going to cost around about 1,200 bucks a tonne to live in. All of a sudden, the cheap product became a real expensive product. So always work it out on that dry matter basis. Remember KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, it's something that I tend to find a lot of the times that people will try to overcomplicate what, what can be pretty simple things. Also, be a bit wary of uh, we have a product for you. Um, it's one of these ones, you know, with a lot of people, they'll, they'll show you some results and they'll put up some figures. Um, and coming from a science background, 
I don't think that it ever make it into a scientific publication anywhere in the country. Uh, some of this research, you know, I saw some data recently at a day where a bloke put up and said, "We've got a product for you. You feed this animal this, you know, it will do really well." Here's our results from a trial we did. The animal sent with this product this year did this. The previous year they sent, they did that. Oh, how long a bow do you want to draw? Okay, so that's one of these ones, you know. Compare apples with apples, like to like. And look, if it sounds too good, good to be true, it usually is. So some of these claims that we hear, um, you know, about doubling performance for the rest of their life and a few other bits and pieces, probably just a couple of issues with those. But, you know, check it out, work it out, make it. Make sure you've got uh, your alarm working. When we're looking at sort of the, the sites and where we're going to look at it, it's really important that we look at your site. Is there a bit of slope, water quality? And the supply of that water. Um, I know I've had issues in the past where we've had more water used and some of the mineral issues that can come up. Also, <coughs> look at the distance, the yards, your storage facilities, etc. Some shelter and also some shade. Um, there's some things that sort of get forgotten. I uh, saw a, an example back uh, in 09 where the producer went, yep, close to my yards, close to my, my feeding facilities. I've got really good water, top spot, you know, everything's sorted out. He even had a couple of little paddocks there handy that he could adjust and just a few hot wires turned it into a beautiful little feeding situation. If you got one thing, it was on black soil. They got four inches of rain. I won't tell you what problems he had, but needless to say, things didn't quite work as well as he thought there after that four inches of rain. So, ideal soil types. Stay away from your heavy plays um, and, and sandy and gravel soils. Pick, pick good location. Uh, was recently out on a Blake's place that uh, picked an old, what had been actually an old gold mining area. And uh, yeah, I don't think you could have got a much better site for where you picked it. Okay, feedlot design. The one thing I've learned in looking at it from uh, a small scale produce operation, there really is no perfect design. Um, your feedlot design will really depend on the area available, land scale, you know, are you going to have it for both? Uh, what's going to be in there? How much capital are you going to put in? And also the labour and the equipment. Some of the paddock feeding situations where I've seen, you know, you can get away with different bits and pieces. This is one side feeding system this bloke set up in a paddock. It um, can be as simple as this too. And I'll show you a photo of uh, this one at the end, if I get a chance. Um, this is creek feeding, so giving those animals a little bit of a tick along. Um, pretty ordinary country, that one. That's all native pastures uh, up, up in between Mandurin and uh, Coonabarra and that one. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be really great, great expense in some of these things, but it's about making it work and making it work for you. If you're looking at the pen system, then there's some the pluses and minuses with that, um, you know, how much expense and effort you go to really down to you. And what we tend to find is that, um, you know, pretty simple system, this place got a bit of conveyor building, uh, can be done quite well and quite easily. Advantage with open troughs, we tend to find they tend to be very cheap to construct. They handle total mix ration, so if you're making up a full mix ration, they tend to do it very easy. Disadvantage though, you're tied in with labour. You've got to be there, you've got to do it. Um, also, there's issues that we tend to see with shy feeders, so a fair bit more labour. You've got to have good equipment on farm to make it up, and also we sometimes get issues with contamination and the like. So, open troughs, be aware of that. The other thing that with an open trough, this tends to be a standard system, you know, it works very well. I like it on the side. You always put it far away from the water, never put it close to your water. The open trough system in the middle of the pen sounds great, but from practical experience, it has some issues. Particularly if we're dealing with younger cattle, younger weaners, um, sheep, can really cause problems. They tend to crowd you when you come in there and start feeding, so it's something that I'll tend to move away from. Total mix rations, you get a complete ration, uh, you, can, you can really build your ration up, you can sort of cut out some of your issues if you start to get problems, 
you can back back one with the amount of grain, a few other things. So you can order that ration at any stage. Um, we tend to find that they can't select against different things. And and can you you can really start to utilise some poorer quality foods that are out there when you're looking at some of your ruckages and the like. Disadvantages we tend to find though that we you need that specialised equipment. Trough feeding really increases your um, your labour. If you're using it in self feeders, it's one of those ones, and there's always ways around these things that will tend to get a bit of bridging. You know, particularly when we're kicking off the feedlot ration, it will tend to bridge. We'll tend to have uh, issues with it coming down. Most of the time, we'll find farmers will find ways around things. Uh, I was out at a glaze place recently, an image feeder across the top. He had a chain running down, in down into the bottom feeder. As the animals ate, moved the chain, started to drop the feed down. All of a sudden, stopped getting that bridging issue. So, have a bit of a think. A uh, bit more preparation time. Um, yeah, it can be issues if you're buying it off farm. Cell mm -hmm. feeders, food's always available. You're reducing that labour. Um, you really, if you do run into troubles with your cell feeders, it can be quite difficult to change. Um, so if all of a sudden we're starting to, we're watching that book and we're starting to see an increase in sort of some undesirable traits there. We can, it's very hard to back off and go back away from it. Um, anyway, this is sort of what we tend to see a lot where blokes will sort of have a little pen. I'll have a few feeders out in the system. Uh, this is how many grogs I had last night, Tess. And what we're seeing is those feeders out there. The problem is you have to go into those yards. Again, um, second you get rain, starts to get wet, it can start to cause issues and can make it an interesting day to get the machinery in and out. I tend to like the system where we've got feeders on the side, the self feeders on the side, and you're either putting it over and in into those feeders from the side, it tends to work a lot better. Grain and roughage separately. This is something I'm seeing more and more of. We're <coughs> seeing more in the north, we're getting a lot of lakes that are direct supply on Woolworths Coles job where they're looking at that requirement. Uh, this bloke, um, you know, site selection is pretty good. Um, uh, he's a producer up, uh, up near Oberon up there in, in the central tablelands. Um, works really well, great spot, it's got good tree shade, etc. Needs wind protection up there, gets a little bit cold. Uh, but, you know, Part of the issue that he's got, he does get that shading, so in winter this yard can get quite foggy. So he is very mindful and he has taken some steps to remedy that in that situation. Advantage, it can be very low cost. Uh, you reduce labour. You generally, most of the time, <coughs> you find in mixed farming zones, everyone's got already got the gear they need to do it. Okay. Disadvantages can be costly to establish. We can get issues where animals will substitute the grain for the roughage. You know, uh, they'll actually eat more of the roughage. We won't sometimes get the performance. But in doing it and doing it right, I've got a producer I deal with up north there where he supplies that, that Woolworths market, sort of selling around about 5,000 a year into there, separate. He's averaging around about 1.4, 1.5 kilos a day, so I reckon. And that's real weight gain. He's not weighing them empty to start off with and weighing them full at the end. Um, okay, you get difficulties in changing that rations and also we tend to get issues with high delivery. This is sort of just a simple mix that this bloke's put up. Uh, we've got a bit of oats, a bit of barley. Know your grain, know what's in there. This is yarrow oats. We actually did a test on that yarrow oats. Uh, it was yarrow oats that actually came from around the training region. It tested up to 12.7 megs of better than 15% protein. Most of the time when you talk to me about grain, uh, about oats grain, you'll see it tends to be a bit lower than that. So be aware of what you're doing. If you don't guess, do a feed test and feed my advice. Same place, place. You can get some waste with that self feeder system. He's got this working really well. It's also tending to work far better because he's got a high quality feed, we're not seeing that waste. If you're using a really poor quality hay in these separate feeding systems, uh, stubble or, or sorghum hay and the like, we can see a hell of a lot more waste in those systems. 
water quality and quantity, it's one of those ones that tends to be forgotten, but really is important. Um, I did a, had a uni student with us there a few years ago and we went out to this bloke's farm. He was having some issues, did the usual, went and stuck my hand in the feed mix to see if I got dust on the back of my hand, looking for fines, went and had a look at the book. No issues there. Then said to him, okay, you know, then you check your water. And we went over and in this animal's pen, we had that much fermented grain sitting on the bottom of it. They don't drink, they won't eat. So, no, I ain't drinking enough. So be aware of that, making sure that you're changing that water and cleaning it. Raised uh, troughs, we tend to find that, particularly with sheep, um, that they're very sensitive to any sort of fines on top. Cattle, not so much. But what you will find out with cattle is that, um, you know, this first photo over here is a classic. They'll come in and start <coughs> drinking. They like that fresh water, so working out a way of getting fresh water in is highly important. But cleaning that trough, cleaning it regularly is really something they do. Get away from that. Um, your feedlot ration really needs to be high energy for maximum weight gains. Balance up your protein. Get good roughage for satisfactory function. The minerals and other bits and pieces, really, if you're looking at 70 to 100 days, then I don't get really hung up on it. The only thing I will do is calcium in limestone, one, one and a half percent, fix up the calcium phosphorus imbalance, and do salt. Um, so to ensure that they don't get also the same. Um, so that's why we always tend to look at it. If you're looking at how to do it and what to do, and sort of making up your own mix, making a kiss mix, this is probably the best thing that's on the web. It's a feed cost calculator. You can get in here, you can put in the feed, you can sort out what's good, what's bad, what's cheap, what's not. And then down the bottom, it allows you to create your own feed mix. So if we're looking at sort of young calves, sort of three to six months where we're doing a proper drought feeding, we've early weaned these type of things and I want 16, 17% protein, then I can fine tune, I can use my grain, I can put in a protein meal and I can really hone in on meeting those animals' requirements and getting good results with it. Also, the one thing that I haven't sort of covered that, that this photo is here to trigger me thinking, this is a uh, bloke who's got uh, Charolais Brangus steers, don't see a huge amount of them down this way. Um, but in this situation, he got told, no, you can't sell, sell those to us, we don't want them. He put them on grain for 70, 80 days. He said, come on, just try a load. All those animals with the blue spots on their back were animals that had enough fat to go. He sent them off down. When we look at the MSA boning group, first time they went down, he had everything from boning group two down to boning group six in those animals. He then got a phone call from that supplier and said, send them. We're happy to take them. So, Getting animals that normally may not fit markets and fuck market specs really well and looking at that meat quality, you can really lift your compliance rate by doing that. <coughs> Finally, creek feeding. This is that same, same steers and cattle from that paddock. These are six month old calves, fed, fed right. Uh, wasn't the world's best year. Average weight after curfew, 318 kilos, the oldest calf in that mob turned six days, six months old the day before I took that photo. So, if you're going to do it, do it properly, do it right, it doesn't have to be really complicated.